Thank you, Tim. Uh, so my talk is how to succeed as a red shirt without even dying. Uh, it's a combination of two uh, uh, media. One is uh, a musical, how to succeed in business without even, uh, without even trying. Uh, and one is a red shirt. So what is a red shirt? Can someone tell me what a red shirt is? Security person, uh, sorry, it's someone who works in security uh, on, uh, the, on Star Trek, on the Enterprise. And what are they known for? Dying is what they're known for. Uh, they're known for, yeah, something's always going wrong with the security people. And I'm sorry to tell you, but uh, that is misleading uh, in every way. Uh, so the red shirts are actually more likely to survive in an episode of Star Trek. This has been statistically worked out. Uh, so if you remove the main cast from every episode, the security team are actually have a much higher percentage chance to survive. <laughs> It's true, it's absolutely true. So I absolutely recommend that if you are, you are less likely to die uh, if you work in security. Okay, so if you work in security, you are less likely to die. So I really recommend you sort of get into this field. It's really quite a fascinating area. Hi, my name's Louis. Uh, and uh, I work, so I, uh, I started as a dev day one when uh, the Xcode beta first, or when the uh, beta came out for the iOS SDK. About four years ago, I pivoted into the security space, uh, working at the Center of Digital Innovation uh, in Dubai, that little blue dot there, which didn't anvil properly because it's too small. Um, uh, but uh, it's, uh, we do some great stuff there. Well, I work at the, uh, the uh, uh, Smart Lab, which does security and compatibility testing for government applications for, all, uh, for uh, federal and local entities over there. Uh, when, I'm back in, when I'm in Australia, I do work for a whole bunch of different companies, mobile dev, security, and I also teach ethical hacking uh, through uh, Dimension Data Learning Solutions. Uh, and I'm also the uh, community chair for learning materials for a uh, credential for mobile device security, uh, training up the mobile IT administrator. So I do a few things. I wear many hats. So what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about threats. We're going to be talking about what is going to be attacking your application. And then we're going to tell you what you can do about it, what things you can put into your application or s certain types of, uh, uh, sort of uh, architectural things that you need to be, able to, to be aware of. We're also going to learn about frameworks, things that uh, you should be aware of or uh, things you should adhere to, guidelines, etc. We'll get through those. So the media. If you've been paying attention to the media this year, security is everywhere. Uh, ransomware has hit every computer, not uh, Petya, uh, WannaCry. It's, uh, it's hitting everything, security is everywhere, and it is perpetrated by this guy or girl. Uh, it is a hooded hacker with an unbranded laptop uh, with matrix text surrounding them. This is, this is your attacker. Uh, and so when I talk to a lot of people in security, they go, or in, in development I should say, they go, I don't really care much about security because no one's going to attack me. No one's going to attack me because this guy doesn't care about me. Or girl, doesn't care about me. Uh, and uh, if you're a bank, this person probably does care about you. But if you're anyone else, maybe not. But what will, or what may go for you, are these guys. A search bar and a bot. What do I mean by that? Well, I'll explain to you in just a moment. So here are your main attack vectors, when people trying to attack you, or attack your company, or attack your application. It's going to be your application itself, your actual physical binary, the network that you're on, and also the server uh, that your application data will live on. So these are our three main attack vectors. Let's look at our first one, the application. So if you were here at Esther's talk yesterday, you would have seen that reverse engineering is really easy. We can get to your source code or some version of your source code, an assembler or a, a, a pseudocode version of it, within minutes. It's really easy to do. I can pick up the Facebook APK and go, here's the source code for Facebook's application. If you want me to demo that, I can do it after the talk. Uh, it's quite easy to do. Now, there are code and strings everywhere. And I, can see all the, I can see a lot of the code. I can see any sort of string you put into this application. So what does that mean? People are storing secrets. People are like, oh, it's compiled. It's ones and zeros. This you know, can't read anything that's in my application. I quick looked it. It was, it was garbage. No one can read this. Uh, but you know, we can see URLs that are inside this application. You might have thought they were private, uh, but they're not. Uh, we've got credentials, passwords, keys. We can find all these things, and quite quickly, too. Now, this is not a new concept. 
Uh, reverse engineering has been around for a very long time. In fact, I'm pretty sure the second wheel was reverse engineered from the first wheel. Someone looked at that and went, I can make one of those, and then put it and uh, reversed it. So what's happened since I last gave this talk two years ago? Well, everything got worse. If that's a, or better, it depends. I'm in the security space, everything got... No, everything got worse. Uh, reverse engineering takes a lot less time. I can do this instantly now. And when I say instantly, I mean that there's a database of almost all applications, millions of applications. Uh, there it is searchable, it is indexed, uh, and it is both for iOS and Android, which means that I can do searching on a very large scale very quickly for these things. So how can I do that? I'll tell you about it in just a moment. Now, for the company that I work for, well, one of the companies I work for here in Australia, Key Options, we do a lot of really cool stuff. We work with uh, technology trying to locate your iOS devices to a meter, meter and a half accuracy. Uh, great for malls, great for prisons, in case we see uh, people smuggling devices in. Uh, we do stuff with drones, broadcasting video in really cool ways. We do uh, uh, erasing hard drives, do stuff with network security. But the one I want to talk to you about today is this guy, MI3 Security. They do rapid identification of threats for security and privacy in mobile applications. And uh, I was speaking to the uh, CTO of uh, MI3, Ken Lloyd, or Ken, uh, and I was telling him, oh, I've got this talk coming up. I want to tell developers about how their applications are insecure. And you said, you know, you've got this database. You've got this database that we can have a look at. And I, he's like, yeah, I do. Yeah, and you know, we've been friends for a long, for a few, long time with the CMDSP. Uh, so uh, what do you want to know? That's a dangerous question, by the way. <laughs> uh, my brain sort of went you know, in lots of places. I'm like, oh, what can I ask? I'm going to search all the applications. What can I ask? So I was like, okay, Ashton did a talk on uh, application transport security and how you shouldn't use certain keys. So I was like, all right, what about the uh, NS HTTP uh, uh, don't allow arbitrary loads key? You know, how many applications are still allowing arbitrary loads? Typed it in. Uh, 94,000 still allow this, with uh, 26,000 doing it inside of a string file. That's an additional. Uh, and I was flabbergasted. I was absolutely floored by the fact that I could do this over a Skype call really quickly. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, so then we you know, sort of went into a few other things. And uh, so I asked him a few more you know, search terms. And then we found some stuff. And then I couldn't tell you about them. And he's, you know, we found some really cool stuff. He's going to get your security engineer to look at it. But essentially, if I tell you, he will uh, probably hunt me down. Uh, so I, I said to him, like, what can I tell these guys? What can I tell developers? What, is, what have you found in, the, in these uh, sort, of, sort of databases? He's like, all right, do you remember Uber? He's like, yeah, Uber. Yeah, they did that. They fingerprinted user data. They tried to skirt around Apple's uh, uh, review process. It's like, so we wanted to find out how many other applications did the same thing that Uber did. So they had a look. And they found out 430 applications also did the same thing that Uber did. 93 of them being banking applications. This is a very interesting statistic. This is something that, and we found this out instantly. This, again, I'm still absolutely floored by the fact that we can do this. And so that was really cool. That was so cool. I, I said, Ken, this is amazing. I'm going to absolutely floor these people. But this is a developer conference. I can't just give statistics. It's the development conference, my favorite conference. I need something sexy. I need something to sort of show. And then there was a pause at the end of the line. It was like, right, let me show you something. So, uh, you know, I, mean, I said I wanted something sexy, something like uh, maybe banking malware or something like that. So he brought up, uh, brought up this one. This is Bank Austria. Uh, it uh, looks like Bank Austria, but what it is, is it is listening for SMS messages and trying to get the two-factor authentication token, and then so they can replay it and steal all your money. Uh, he picked this one because it was like Bank Australia, and so he, anyway, that was, that was a nice little giggle we had, and then we moved on. Uh, so we can uh, look inside this application. We can see all the different sort of, uh, we can see the, the malware that's inside of it. There's quite a number of malware inside of it. I'm not going to go too deep into it other than when the spinning wheel loads. Oh, no internet. That's going to ruin my next demo. Uh, 
Uh, and you know, we looked through the analysis, we looked through uh, the network, and you can see it's actually looking at a whole bunch of uh, different uh, uh, URLs for different, uh, different uh, carriers. So China Mobile, AT&T was on there. Um, we can see what URLs inside of this application is sort of looking for. Uh, and then uh, he said, well, let's have a look at this. So we looked into this product called App Visualizer. Press the button. App Visualizer. And I can see uh, the uh, bank Austria. And I click on the malware section here. Uh, of course, you're going to get me to log in. So we see all the different malware that's in there. But the next thing that was really cool was that I could pick a piece of malware and sort of go, right, what other applications also share this malware? I can see that for you know, many different types of uh, applications. And then I could also do the same thing with domains. And so I can see what other domains, what are the domains inside of my Bank of Austria application, and then see what other applications share the same domain. I can do the same thing with classes. I can do the same thing with the Android certificate in this case. Looks like it's taking some time to load. But I think you get the general idea, is that I can click on one of these, it gives me a sprawl of all the different domains, URLs, uh, there we go, I can pick one of these, so KTF wing, it's probably not a good example, but, so we can see all the different applications, those red line means there's malware associated, or there are high security risk I should say. I can pick one of these, uh, I'm not going to pick that one, I don't know what it stands for. Crying baby, uh, and it would have it may have malware associated with it. In this case, so that gives you a general idea of what we can sort of do with a, with something like this. Skip over the, the video because it worked because the internet was fine. So that's what we that's what I can do. What can you do? The honest answer is not much. It's pretty scary. But what it do, what I, what you can do is know about this. It means you should not be putting secrets in your application. I'm not telling you to stop running apps. I love apps. Please keep writing apps. But it means that don't store your secrets in there because they are searchable. They are findable. If you must put anything that's secret in there, use obfuscation. So use uh, iOS obfuscator. Use uh, ProGuard for Android. DexGuard if you've got a little bit of money. Absolutely recommend obfuscation to hide any sort of secrets you may have in your application. That is our application. Let's talk about network. So we've got a few different attack factors for a network. Uh, by the way, I'm putting on my foil hat for this one. I'm starting to think that foil hat's maybe a good idea. Uh, browsers are safe, ish, um, but they're safe in the, for the purpose of this talk. You can see that lock symbol. That lock symbol means good. We're happy. Uh, if we don't see the lock symbol or something goes wrong, we get told. There's a little notification box saying something's wrong. That, that the burden is for us to figure it out. Now, apps are safe. We don't know. We get a login page, we have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. Instead of it being up to the user to decide, it's up to the developer or the app to decide. It's up to you guys to decide. And if you get it wrong, I'll never know. I'll never know if there's someone in a coffee shop siphoning information. It just won't come up. Now, if you're using you know, NSGL session, you're safe for, pretty, for, for some of these, but not all frameworks are, are, are good at this. Not a You're relying on whatever the framework thinks is an appropriate connection. And in fact, even ATS doesn't detect everything. Uh, doing a little bit of quick test, there was a few things that Chrome thought were uh, bad, but uh, Safari thought it was fine, and therefore ATS thought it was fine as well. Uh, I tried to file a bug report for this, but the bug report was down at the time. Uh, so I'll, I'll do it later. Um, so uh, this, is, and this is not something that's old. This happened last week again. There is a banking application that had this same vulnerability. The people are making the same mistakes year on year and year. So I'm going to teach you some, some concepts here. I need two volunteers. I've already picked them. Can I get these two down in the front here? That's yeah, yeah, Tim and James, give a round of applause. <laughs> Tim, can I get you to stand here? James, get you to stand here. Tim's our server. James is our iPhone app. Uh, and uh, Tim has... A certificate. <laughs> so this is a, this is a uh, SSL certificate. This is a he has. A, this is proof that this is definitely Tim. 
You know it's definitely Tim. It says so. Um, it's got his face. And uh, James, can you tell me who that's been signed by? Uh, it's been signed by the Queen. The Queen. The Queen. We trust. We trust the Queen. Uh, you know, there's there was a chain of trust. You know, Queen maybe said sent Bond, and Bond checked with Tim. He's definitely Tim. We trust this. And so because we trust this, they make a secure connection. That's a, that's rolled up. <laughs> Hold the other side. They made a secure connection that no one else can, can, uh, can listen into. No one else can listen into. Uh, and there are many queens. There's all sorts of queens. There's over 200 queens. And if there's one of the top ones go down, we can invalidate the rest of them, which is great. Now, anyone, anyone can be a queen. Or a root certificate authority, sorry. Anyone can be a queen. Uh, but no one else would believe you. And that's when you get this concept of self science certificates. So I want to give you a demonstration of that. So uh, let me give you a demonstration of sort of a fake uh, person. Can I get you to hold that for me? James, can I get you to help me out for a second? Oh my God. <laughs> 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 you can just uh, help me stand up. <laughs> this is our fake Tim. This is our man in the middle, literal man in the middle. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he uh, has his own little certificate. Uh, so uh, you can see here we've got our uh, man in the middle here. Now it's going to be this person's job to try to do one of two things. One, intercept the communication from Tim to Tim, no, from Tom to Tim, or get in the middle of it and try to read what's going on. That's going to be the two things that he has. Now, if he's going to try to uh, have a, another channel between it, he's going to set up what's called a rogue access point or an evil twin. Huh. Um, and he's going to do that with something like this. It's a Wi-Fi pineapple, and they're just going to connect to it, and he's going to have some, his own certificate. This is a self-signed certificate. You know, if it was a browser, it would say this is self-signed. And in the browser, you're going to go, oh, it's self-signed, don't trust it. But if you're in an app, you don't know. You have no idea. Uh, and so uh, it's up to the developer to make sure that's correct. Now, uh, in the other, other example, uh, you may have uh, someone that's trying to listen in between these two or try to do something else. That is where we have SSL pinning. Now, SSL pinning is that with the application, you bundle in a version of the certificate. So James has one inside of his application. Tim has one in his application. And because they, are, they match, it's, he, he looks at the server, oh yes, these two match, we definitely trust this connection. So SSL pinning is a great way to protect your application. Now the one thing that can go wrong is that if uh, Tim decides to change his, all of a sudden, uh, he's, he's not going to trust that server anymore. So you need to be careful with how you do this. Uh, I believe that's all I have for you guys. Please sit down, give my, my volunteers a round of applause. I don't know what to do with you. I uh, hadn't thought this part through. Uh, you can go there. <laughs> so you don't need to own the router. There's a whole bunch of attacks in this area. But you know, the point is not the attacks, even though they can be done by a seven-year-old. Uh, the, the attacks are not the point. You must assume that anything that's being transmitted over the router, or the, the user is using unsecure Wi-Fi. You must assume they're at Macca's, they're at the airport, they're at Starbucks, they're at my, they're, not my hotel, they're at the hotel, uh, and uh, the, the, they could be being listened into. And they're not easily identifiable by a matrix screen and a hoodie. Sometimes it's a ski mask and a, a suit and tie, uh, but it's always an unbranded laptop. Uh, so what can you do? Uh, TLS, HSTS, uh, it, for it to be 100% effective, server needs to be right, client needs to be right. So on your server, have SSL, TLS, sorry, TLS everywhere, implement HSTS, enable secure cookies, and uh, check your server configuration. This is an awesome page for checking that. Uh, it looks like that, you'll get some nice, uh, nice charts. What can you do on the iOS side? For the love of God, please implement ATS. Two years ago when they brought it out, I said I could kiss that engineer. I still will, uh, because ATS is great. It's, it's opt-out. Uh, security, which is great. We love, we love opt-out security because it's automatically in unless they turn it off. Please avoid these uh, keys and try to implement certificate pinning if you can. 
On Android, you have to opt into network security configuration, but there's also stuff you can do in your manifest as well. Uh, so uh, please uh, have a look at those. That's your network. Let's have a look at servers. So you know, if you have millions of users, the chances are they're going to go after your servers. Now, we're going to skip these ones because you hear about these all the time. They're actually really effective. They're amazingly effective. Our pen testers use these awesomely, and I can't wait to do them as awesomely as they do. Uh, if you want to protect against a lot of these, really, you just need to avoid this phrase. Oh, I should validate this. No, no, do validate it. Work out how you're going to do it and actually validate your requests. But I want to talk, oh, validate, validate, validate. So this is my common phrase. Any data going to your server is attacking you. Any data coming out of your server is attacking your, client, your, your customer. That sounds really paranoid. I know that. But you have to assume this as developers, as secure, thoughtful developers. Let me teach you an example. Let me tell you about an example. So databases. We have MySQL, Oracle, Postgres. They're secure. Asterisks. Um, yeah, they, they have some nice sort of default security-ish. Now, uh, we had some new ones lately. There's a lot of these NoSQL ones. So things like your MongoDBs. Uh, and some of their default security was bad. It was so bad that as of earlier this year, uh, we had uh, unauthenticated open ports on the internet, MongoDB, 25 terabytes of data exposed, just with MongoDB. With Hadoop distributed file system, it was five petabytes of data unauthenticated on open ports on the internet. That is an insane amount of data, an insane amount of data. Uh, and in fact, according to one of the comments on the page here on, the, on that, on that uh, research, it's now at six petabytes. It's gone up. We've told people about this. The leaking is going up. This is not how things should work, but it is how it's working. Uh, how am I going for time there, Tim? A few minutes? Ten minutes? I was about to get the two-minute part and start at this, uh, part of the stage. So let's show you Shodan. Shodan. If you're in security, you know Shodan. If you're not in security, you, Shodan is an anime character, Shogun, something. It's something, it's something you've never heard of, potentially. Um, now, Shodan is a search engine for every single uh, uh, port that is open on the internet, on any IPv4 address. Any port, IP address, you can, it's and searchable. And uh, there are some really popular ones. And you see one of the popular ones there is any webcam that's open. We're not going to be opening that. It's a live talk. Bad things happen in this space. All right? You never want to go into that thing. But you know, we're talking about people's bedrooms. We're talking about at the front of people's houses. We're talking about uh, business centers. We're talking about lots of different things where people have installed some sort of IoT device and just let it stream. And they don't know the security behind it. They have no clue. One of the more disturbing ones is uh, industrial control systems. P power plants have ports open to the internet with an authentication page. How secure that authentication page is, I don't know. I don't want to test any of them because I'll probably get arrested. Um, but the fact is that someone who, is le who le cares about that less, who potentially lives in a different country, um, they, will, they, they will try. And they may get access to a power plant information, which is quite scary. What I want to talk about with you guys is databases. Uh, and sort of what we're looking at in this space. So if I open up databases here, uh, they've actually clicked, they've actually set things up so it's easy for me to have a look at all these different databases that are open on the internet. Let's pick MongoDB because I'm, I'm picking on MongoDB today. I apologize if you love MongoDB and any MongoDB people that may be here. Um, uh, it, it happens to where all those things are on that list. And uh, here we have a list of IP addresses. And anything you can sort of see data for and how many databases they have, that is unauthenticated data. That is, I don't need to put in a username and password. I can just access this information. That's scary. That is, that is uh, you know, there is not uh, security by default. People aren't thinking securely. Uh, and so if I was to uh, select one of these, let's select this one. Apologies to that IP address. I'm not picking a new, I swear. I can see all the different ports it's got open. Looks like it's probably a proxy server as well. It's got 8080, or it's got some sort of uh, you know, internal system that maybe we can get access to. Uh, and you can see all the different sort of header information. And then we get to 
27017, which is the MongoDB port, and we can see all the information about the database, and if I connected it with the uh, Mongo uh, control, uh, then I'd be able to get access to the database. So when I tell you that a hooded hacker is not going to come and get you, I'm telling you that a search bar and a bot is going to come and get you because there's a lot of things that are you know, secure and not secure by default or haven't been considered, and those are things that are going to get attacked. So these, a lot of these MongoDB uh, databases, uh, they, uh, got, uh, they got ransomed. They got ransomed. They got, uh, they got encrypted, and people, you know, they, 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 uh, they, someone accessed their servers, they encrypted their databases, and therefore they had to pay, potentially pay a ransom. These, things, these attacks are happening right now. This is not some theoretical future. This is what's happening right now. Tinfoil hat, anyone? Um, so what can you do? There are hardening guidelines. There are hardening guidelines for your operating system, for the, running your web server, Linux, Microsoft, Mac OS, web servers. Um, there are uh, uh, web, uh, hardening guidelines for Apache, Nginx, uh, all your other type of web servers, your databases, there are hardening guides for those, there are ones for languages, things you shouldn't be using, things that aren't safe, etc. Please read these guidelines. Uh, they, there are a few pages, maybe there's a few more, but they're really important for you to know. Uh, and also use a WAF, use a web application firewall. These have become really popular lately because everyone's getting it wrong. Uh, and so having a firewall in front of it is something that people understand. Uh, and all it does is just basic signature checking, so if I can obfuscate around that, I can still get access. But it's still a good reference. It's still something you should be looking at. What frameworks should you follow? I'm a, I love OWASP. I love OWASP. Uh, as a, uh, the web project and the mobile project, uh, they have a top 10 list of vulnerabilities for both web servers and for apps. Uh, definitely recommend you have a look at those and see whether or not you may be vulnerable to some of those. Uh, and the, and oh, I we're releasing at the end of the year the mobile security testing guide and the mobile app security verification guide, uh, a standard. So I recommend you have a look at those as well. So there's lots of things in this space. So let me tell you how I learn. And I actually, I really, I love teaching people. That's why I run ethical hacking courses. I love teaching people. Uh, and so uh, I, I read a lot of RSS feeds. If you'd like to read the same ones I read, please visit this link. Uh, I love Twitter. I wasn't a big fan of, de of uh, Twitter on, as a developer. I love it as an infosec person. I have a list of all the people I think are awesome. Please follow those, uh, some of those people. I listen to podcasts. Please listen to really good podcasts. There are awesome lists. They're literally called awesome lists. They exist for a whole bunch of different topics. They're hosted on GitHub, and people keep adding more and more tools to it. There's ones for all sorts of hacking for just iOS and just, and just Android security, if that's what you're interested in. You should follow me. Uh, at Proxy Blue, I love Twitter. I'm on it uh, a lot more often than I used to be. If I've met you, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, I'm okay with that. It's security plus pictures of my kids. Please, you know, you can enjoy that as well, or just Twitter, and you'll just get security stuff. Uh, I blog, Louis.land. What a great domain. I love saying, just saying Louis.land. It's such, I love it so much. It's so good. Uh, but it's just a medium blog, so feel free to uh, check it out. Uh, and that. Uh, is the end of my talk. Uh, so uh, please give me a round of applause because I'm done. Also, where did you get that? Uh, there's a little thing that funsizeprints.com. Can you actually read it out? So. Can anyone get these? Are they available? Yeah, I've got it online. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> funsizecardouts.com today. Yeah, they're a Melbourne group. I actually went to train there on, on Monday to go get this. Probably, yeah. <laughs> or AR kit's cheaper. I can't believe all of you. I think it's great. It is terrible.